comment from Nonsequently. Uh, I don't think reform is a solution, but to be fair, it can lessen the damage done, even if temporarily, while we work towards long la- towards lasting systemic change. Exactly. That's exactly right. And that's Rosa Luxemburg's point. That's my point, which is that it's not necessarily a problem for reforms, but know what they are. Know that they're not the end goal. Yeah. Bert, she's criticizing reforms as an end in and of them uh, in and of itself, which right, is Bernstein. because it seems to be Bernstein was saying like, uh, yes, we can work for a reform, and then after that becomes permanent, we can work for another reform, and then that becomes exactly. permanent, we can ra- work for another reform. But that's not really how it works. Welcome to Red Reviews, the podcast where we talk about a variety of books uh, with a Marxist and anarchist perspective. Thanks, with my co-host Justin Clark. Thanks for joining me, Justin. Thank you, Corey. How's it going? Ah, uh, it's not too bad, you know. Good. It is good. what it is, anyway. It is, yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, so it goes. Um, yeah, no, it's been a very busy fall. Um, yeah, busy year. So it's been. You know, I've had to, we've, we're doubling up this week. We're going to do two shows Tuesday, today and Thursday night, because I've been busy with a bunch of other speaking engagements and work. And, you know, you've been busy, super crew busy with work too. So yeah, as we were saying in the pregame, this is not our day job, folks. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So we got to fit it in where we can. Exactly. Exactly. So tonight, I'm really excited about tonight. Um, so we have done a lot of, um, sort of foundational episodes about the history and theory of Marxism. And we've done it with many different ways. We've obviously we've read Marx, we've read Engels, we've read Lenin, we've, we've read Mao. Um, and we've read some books relating to more sort of libertarian Marxism. Um, and in that sort of libertarian Marxist vein, um, tonight we'll be talking about Rosa Luxemburg, um, often referred to as the anarchist's favorite Marxist. Um, and I can understand why, um, you know, and I think she is someone who is often left out of the discussion of Marxist thinkers who are really not only sort of reaffirming a lot of the major components and ideas of Marxism, but sort of reformulating them in a way that is sort of new and engaging and exciting. Um, and you know, she was knee deep in the revolutionary movement herself. Um, you know, she was born um, in what today is known as Poland, um, and you know she um, she was truly one of the most, I think, influential and brilliant Marxists of her era. Yeah. Um, so tonight, the book we'll be doing is um, Reform or Revolution and Other Writings. This is Very an nice. excellent Dover paperback edition. Um, we're gonna go through four of her major works that are in this, um, including uh, an introduction by Paul Boole, um, whose book Marxism in the United States will be doing later on in the fall. So, cool. um, But he wrote about her in the preface or the introduction, the Dover edition, just kind of give you a sense of who she was. He writes, a Polish Jew, member of an intelligentsia and a people eradicated by the Holocaust, Luxembourg was at once a supreme democrat and keen analyst of global economic imbalance. Better than anyone else among an exceedingly rich generation of radicalized intellectuals, she perceived the dangers of confining the mobilization of working class energies to a political vanguard. So what does all that really mean? So there's really, we're talking, we often talk about a lot of Marxist thinkers in relation to Lenin, right? Mm -hmm. Because the primary sort of flavor of Marxism that has in many respects dominated the 20th century and into the early 21st century has been Leninism or, um, or some, yeah, or some, it's all tied to Leninism in some way. Leninism um, or it's Trotskyism, which is kind of in and of itself a sort of sub genre of Leninism. It used to be buddies with Leninism, but then it quit. But then it quit, <laughs> you know, cause MLs don't get along with Trotskyists <laughs> and so forth. Yeah. Um, and but with Luxembourg, she kind of kind of eschews all of that. She just sort of says, like, look, 
I think it's better for us to understand the relationship of really, I think, uh, three couple of things, a few core ideas of hers that we'll be kind of talking about tonight. One of them is the necessity of revolution and, and revolution being a key element of Marxism in and of itself. But that revolution can go in different forms. Two, she often thinks about it in relationship to the masses. So she is very much playing into, you know, sort of thinking about the ways in which uh, the mass strike influences revolutionary movements. So the, one of the essays we'll be talking about tonight is the mass strike. Got a, a couple of oh, uh, comment on, uh, on Twitch from some random geek. Does anyone get along with Trotskyists? <laughs> <laughs> Trotskyists don't even get along with Trotskyists. <laughs> some of them are part of the Fourth International and some are not. So it's like, you know, I mean, um, and then some are sort of like, like PSL, of which I used to be a member of, like PSL is like, they used to be sort of the Workers' World Party. So WWP, and then the offshoot of that was PSL, like those all kind of came out of the... Um, you know, the Sam Marcy tradition of sort of American Marxism and Trotskyism. It's all tied together. I mean, it's, yeah. it, you know, um, but there isn't like a, like, there's not, when it comes to Luxembourg, I, I think if, if people said, oh, I'm a Luxembourgist, I think she would be a little like, she would kind of chafe. Take it back. <laughs> because it was never how she conceived of it. You know, right. she conceived herself as a Marxist, you know, she didn't call herself like, Leninism or like, like a Lenin or like, I'm a, I'm a Marxist. Like, that's what I am. And while she is quite critical of anarchism and Anne writes about that, I think fairly clearly. Um, and we talked a little bit about that when we talked about the revolutionary affinities book yeah. um, and others. Uh, there's a lot, I think of affinity there too, in the sense that she really believes that revolutions are truly guided by the masses yeah. and the mass masses interaction in them and the development of them and two in the notion of spontaneity that 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 there are times in which you know trying to plan every perfect little thing out may not work so you have right. to be flexible and i think that's something that is i think extremely relevant um sure. to her discussion um the, i think the big thing about her is that you know she was very much against world war one as was lenin was she was a member of the of the spd you know this the social democratic party of germany um and had a very open break so there was a very open break with the spd and her forming of her own party um and uh a lot of these very deep political differences would lead to her murder in 1919 um, and so she does not live long enough to see what comes later and to be a part of what comes later, whether it's the attempt of a re revolution in Germany, the failure of said Germany's revolution, the, yeah. the, the, the failures of the Weimar Republic, the rise of fascism and the rise of Stalinism. She, she didn't see any of that. Right. So it's a very interesting counterfactuals that I think we can get into. And we can definitely talk about those counterfactuals when we get into talking about the last essay in the book about the Russian Revolution. Right. Um, of which, you know, she would, in the parlance of our, of our sort of left-wing tendencies, people would call it critical support. She sort of had <laughs> critical right. support for the Russian Revolution. She had a lot of criticisms of it. And I think yeah. had she lived long enough, I think she would have seen some of those. Um, or at the very least, had she lived long enough, maybe things would have been different because they could have been different too. Yep. yep. Um, so anyway, so let's, I guess, first start with talking about um, the first essay in the book or the first pamphlet that's in the book. Because all four of these essays were published in various times. Some were published in your lifetime. Some were published decades later. Okay. Uh, they were translated into English by different people. Some didn't get published until the 1930s. Um, but the four that we'll discuss tonight that are in the book are Reform and Revo Reform and Revolution, Marxism or Leninism, which is the title of it, of the, of the essay, although I think she like actually named it something else, but that's what everybody kind of calls it. Um, the mass strike and the Russian revolution. Okay. Um, so uh, the first one we'll talk about is reform or revolution. It's kind of the most important one in the book because it really does get us to the heart of that classic discussion among us, right. which is what 
is the path to socialism. Is it a evolutionary path in the form of us sort of taking gradually through democratic elections um, the gradual sort of takeover of the bourgeois state and sort of recalibrating right. it to our own interests in the development of a social democratic society or a democratic socialist society? Or is the real path revolutionary in that we actually have to make a clean break with the past? And I, in, in, in the words of Lenin, smash the state um, or sort of and we're sort of reconstituted as the dictatorship of the proletariat, um, of which Rosa Luxemburg believed in, but she believed in it differently. So it's like mm. we're going back to the more classical Marxist notion of what the dictatorship right, of the proletariat right. is, which it's is not necessarily the vanguard party kind of. Yes, it's not, and it's not necessarily a dictatorship. It really is just workers' government. That would be the, the constitution of a workers' government. Um, and she's not necessarily against uh, reforms in and of themselves. So mm -hmm. as she writes in the introduction, she says, between social reforms and revolution, there exists for the social democracy an indissoluble tie. The struggle for reforms is its means, the social revolution its aim, which is kind of the way I view it. So any reforms may necessarily be good right? in the short term, right? But we could have an honest conversation about the reforms in the long term, that they could pacify the working class and that the more radical energies to push us towards a, a more radical system, a more, you know, more socialist system. I've heard, uh, you know. I've heard people argue against like the idea of a UBI. Mm -hmm. uh, because of that, because it be, could be a pacifier to uh, uh, the working class. Yeah, I think I go back and forth on the UBI question because this is a good one. Because I think in on principle, I, and I think in terms of how we view politics, we should be against it. Mainly just because um, I know how the li neoliberal state would use the UBI. So like if we lived in like a social democratic society where there was like universal health care and universal family paid leave and and, you know, very like, you know, and like worker time off and like the like if we lived in more of like a Nordic social democracy. Right. right? And you wanted to get put an UBI on top of that. Right. That one I can understand. Yeah, imagine the American version of UBI, right? Like it's like right. okay, we're gonna cut everything else, right? <laughs> and and only people who make this much money or less are gonna get it. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, this is exactly my point because the United States. This is just a. This is a quick point. So two points. One, the United States, in some respects, already kind of has a UBI. Hmm. It's the income tax credit. Okay. So like. Um, the income tax credit, which is in the United States, when you file your taxes, um, you can often receive money back from the federal government. So if you have paid too much um, or depending on your income, the federal government will not only not make you pay your income taxes, if you've sort of already paid them through your wages, they'll give you all that money back and they'll give it to you in a lump sum. Um, and in fact, the person who really pitched the idea of the earned income tax credit more than anyone was Milton Friedman, um, right. the right wing economist. He called it the reverse income tax. Yeah. And so that's how a UBI would be done in the United States. It would be a way yeah. of like killing TANF. It'd be a way of killing Social Security. It'd be a way of killing Medicare and just saying, oh, we're just going to give people money. Yeah. So and um, uh, some random geek says, mark my words, if the UBI is implemented, the UBI would just be just used to save capitalism again. Unconditional, guaranteed, essential necessities. That's great. Yeah, <laughs> I've also heard it described as universal basic services. Yeah, um, I think that was the term that maybe Aaron Bastani used, um, who wrote um, uh, lux uh, "What's it called?" Fully automated luxury capitalism. Oh, yeah, an excellent yep. book. Um, you, if you had universal basic services, then yeah, a UBI makes sense. I mean, it makes perfect sense. But in the American neoliberal system, with a very limited welfare state. And, and I mean that in every sense of the word, it's an extremely yeah. limited welfare state. I think UBI would be one of the ways in which the, the political class would kill other forms of welfare. 
because they could make the argument of, well, we're giving you all this money. Yeah. So that's, you know, that's kind of the issue, you know, so, but UBI would be very easy to give. I mean, you could, I mean, you could do it very easily. You could either do it through the earned income tax credit monthly, which is what the United States did under the first, like the COVID bill that Biden passed in 2021. Um, there was a, a, a sort of childhood, an extended, expanded childhood tax credit that lifted like half of America's children out of poverty. Like it was amazing. And of course it died because Joe Banchin didn't want it. So, and all those kids, yeah, that's all right. that went back to work. But that's like, some, that's the way you do it. You know, you do it through either income tax credit or you do it through social security. You know, it's very easy to do it through social security, whether you, um, so there are different ways you could do it, but ultimately I think that is a reform that like on the on like on the surface sounds great, but when you think about it more deeply in the context of U.S. capitalism, is not great. Um, and uh, yeah, <laughs> so you know, so like and like a lot of these that we've done on the show, um, whether it's Marx or Lenin or whatever, this is written in response to someone. Ah. So. Uh, I think to set up the broader discussion, we have to talk about the person she's writing to or writing about. So the person she's writing about is a guy named Edward Bernstein. Okay. Edward Bernstein, who was one of the sort of early leaders of the Social Democratic Party in Germany. He had known Engels personally. He had edited um, w some uh, works of Marxism. So he was very much tied into the Marxist, Marxist world of, of socialism in Europe. But the thing about him, though, was that he basically made certain arguments and said that the, really the way to socialism is through an evolutionary process, through free elections, and that you could get enough people in, in, in government to then change the system over time to become more socialist. Because he argued that some of the things that Marx claimed would happen under capitalism didn't really happen. So... Bernstein talks about how, you know, there were certain things that kind of worked out okay. And, and uh, you know, his three basis, um, you know, he, he, so basically he, 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 he gets to the point of saying that, like, capitalism hasn't been as bad as we've been told it would be. Like, certain people's standard of living has gone up, that, um, that you're seeing a more coordination of production. You're seeing, you know, you're seeing the growing wealth of the working class in the development of labor unions. So he's like, sort of like, he's kind of laying okay. all these things out and he's saying, well, we have all of these like different forms of social organization that could lead us to a more evolutionary form of socialism. Okay. And she kind of lays out why he's wrong and why the things that he's arguing about capitalism being beneficial, they may be in the short term, but in the long term, they're not going to be because ultimately there is still a tremendous amount of exploitation and, and human misery that exists within capitalism itself. Right. You know, and it's, you know, and whether it's 30% misery or 20% misery doesn't really matter. It's, it's still misery in and of itself. The so gains she, made by one group are always taken off the backs of another. Exactly. Um, so she kind of lays out his sort of basic theoretical point. So he said, so this is Bernstein's like social democracy model. So she writes okay. from this theoretic stand is derived the following um, general conclusion about the practical work of, of the social democracy. The latter must not direct its daily activity toward the conquest of political power, but toward the betterment of the condition of the working class within the existing order. It must not expect to institute socialism as a result of a political and social crisis, but should build socialism by means of the progressive extension of social control and the gradual application of the principle of cooperation. That is Bernstein's point of view. That okay. is his view. And here's where she lays out why he's wrong. So she says, contra to that, the scientific basis of socialism rests, as is well known, on three principal results of capitalist development. First, on the growing anarchy of the capitalist economy, leading inevitably to its ruin. Second, on the progressive socialization of the process of production, which creates the germs of the future social order. And third, on the increased organization and consciousness of the proletarian class, which constitutes the active factor in the coming revolution. 
So this is the classic Marx, Marxist viewpoint, and this is her mm -hmm. viewpoint too, which is that, you know, there is growing anarchy in the capitalist economy that is going to bring numerous problems. One. Two. Capitalism will eat itself. <laughs> capitalism will eat itself. Two. Despite the fact that capitalism will eat itself, within firms themselves, there's a certain amount of planning and coordination, which mm -hmm. in and of itself is good, that we could then use to build the new social order. And three, the development of class consciousness. Those three things are really crucial. Now, the issue that she has with Bernstein is that she argues that all of the benefits that he sees of capitalism, whether it's the sort of equilibrium of credits or the the development of labor practices that are more beneficial to workers that you're, he's seeing all of these sort of things that have made capitalism less shitty and less problematic less alienating less um less exploitative but yet in but but nevertheless capitalism is still in a crisis Right. Regardless of whether or not it's in the short term may look like it's improving, in the long term, it lends itself towards crisis. Yeah. And that crisis point is that that sort of fracture within society that lends itself towards a potential revolution. Um, and so so she kind of lays out why a lot of this is an issue. So she says, like, um, you know, she sort of. He, so Bernstein kind of argues that credit has has sort of stabilized capitalism, and so we don't necessarily have to be revolutionary as a result. Well, she sort of, excuse me, she responds to that, and she says, credit not only aggravates the crisis in its capacity as a dissembled means of exchange, it also helps to bring and extend the crisis by transforming all exchange into an extremely complex and artificial mechanism that having a minimum of metallic money as a real base is easily disarranged at the slightest occasion. We see that credit, instead of being an instrument for the suppression or the attenuation of crises, is on the contrary, a particularly mighty instrument for the formation of crises. And we yeah. see this all the time. So like, you know, we see that we, there are constant recessions that are built upon um, a, a financial institution over leveraging itself, meaning that it's yep. taken on more debts than it can pay off. Recently, one of them was Silicon Valley Bank, which collapsed earlier this year, um, which is a very large bank out on out in the West Coast. Um, and there was a bank run. And essentially what had happened was as the Fed was raising interest rates, um, the assets that they had were no longer being able, were no they were required to keep more money on hand in order to make the system work, but they didn't have it. So it was, mm. you know, so it was an, it was an empire sort of built upon the fluctuations of credit. So contra Bernstein, who thinks that credit can stabilize capitalism, actually credit exacerbates the crises of capitalism. Right. Um, yeah. So one of the other things she talks about is like, um, one of the real issues with modern capitalism is the cartelization of trusts, the development of centralization, monopolies, right? And these are bad. I mean, this is something that Lenin wrote about too in Imperialism, the highest stage of capitalism. Um, and Marx wrote about too, that over time, capitalism lends itself towards the consolidation of these organizations into large, organi into large firms that yep. then use their power to facilitate short-term gains, but could create long-term crises. So she kind of writes about that. So she, you know, um, you know, generally speaking, combines treated as a manifestation of the capitalist mode of production can only be considered a definite phase of capitalist development. Cartels are fundamentally nothing else than a means resorted to by the capitalist mode of production for the purpose of holding back the fatal flaw of the rate of profit in certain branches of production. So this is another classic capitalist point, which is the, the um, decline in profit over time. This is something you see all the time. And the way that capitalism sort of reaffirms itself in spite of that contradiction is by concentrating more and more and more because it offsets the decline in profit over time makes it look not so bad. You know, you can have firms that can kind of join together, you get a sugar high, things look good, but then long term it's still going down. Mm -hmm. So so 
again, something that that she writes about and says that like, look, none of these things are are, are going to actually stabilize capitalism. They're just not. And and ultimately, it's going to lead to a situation where um, where it's going to necessitate a revolutionary break because you cannot um, you cannot keep this going long enough where um, where these contradictions don't come to light, where these problems within the system don't come into don't yeah. don't come to light. So you know, so so you have that issue too, and ultimately, you know, she kind of really gets to the heart of the matter. I think on a later page where she's writing about, you know, um, yeah. So it is not true that socialism will arise automatically from the daily struggle of the working class. Socialism will be the consequence of one, the growing contradictions of capitalist economy, and two, of the comprehension by the working class of the unavoidability of the suppression of these contradictions through a social transformation. When in the matter of revisionism, and she's referring to Bernstein there. Right. The first condition is denied and the second is rejected. The labor movement finds itself reduced to a simple corporative and reformist movement. We move here in a straight line toward the total abandonment of the class viewpoint. So this gets into um, the sort of notion that unions will save us all, which some of that is true. But it's only true in to the extent to which unions could be militant. Right, right. So if unions are in service of capital or they are sort of uh, <laughs> sort of uh, manifestations or extensions of a form of management, this is what Lenin called the labor aristocracy, right? Right. Then you cannot reform that system because it will ultimately self-justify what it's doing in holding back the working class from a more revolutionary break. Right. And not seeing the sense of class consciousness without noticing the real contradictions inherent in democracy, right? In 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 the late in the contradictions within capitalism and within liberal democracy as it's constituted under capitalism. Right. I think a good example of this is look how terrible the unions have been in the United States since they became more directly involved in the Democratic Party. You know, prior to 1960, basically near 1970 most labor unions were fairly politically independent or yeah. they were of different parties so jimmy hoffa who ran the teamsters was a republican right back before republicans were extreme right wingers and um and in fact if you look at the history of the labor movements in the united states what you see is you see that there are more radical unions like the industrial workers of the world. Mm -hmm. And then you see more conservative unions like the American Federation of Labor, AFL. Um, the AFL didn't allow in women. It didn't allow in African-Americans. So that was, so there's the more militant labor unions constituted by like the IWW and later by the CIO and some factions of the, United Auto Workers, UAW, in the 1940s under, at the time, were Marxist, standard Trotskyist factions. Right. You see this militant labor organizing is often quelled by the conservative elements within that union itself. Yeah. Because it's looking for more of the short-term gains rather than the long-term struggle. Yeah. And as you've seen, I think as we've seen more than anything – that as the unions in our in the United States have gotten closer in political alignment with the Democratic Party, the union membership has gone down. They have become less and less of an active force in American life, that they have become in effect neutered. Yeah. So, you know, and I think you need no, any, ex you need no example of this than Joe Biden showing up at a UAW rally, right? The first mm -hmm. president, people being a big historic point about it, the first American president ever to you know, be a part of a labor struggle, labor strike. Um, and I guess it's sort of a big deal. You could look at it that way. You know, the, 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 the sort of Bernstein, the revisionist would say, look, see, we have the president of the United States on our side. We right. don't need to have a revolutionary break because he's with us. Whereas that... <laughs> Luxembourg would look at it the way I look at it, which is that the moment that he stepped into that rally was the moment that that movement was neutered, mm. was nullified. 
because it is it's essentially a form of the of a bourgeois politician of the bourgeois state telling them telling a labor union you are under my thumb you do what i want and and it's a capitulation it's ultimately mm. it, it's you know if i was the leader of the uaw and we were a militant labor union i would tell joe biden to go fuck himself but that's right. me <laughs> you know, um, you know, like it would be it would be no, we don't want you here. We saw what you did to the railroad workers last year. You fucked them over. You're probably going to fuck us over, too. Yeah, That's right. And so, yeah, I think you can look at it like the way that, you know, the revisionists would and see it as a positive and or you can look at it like a revolutionary Marxist would like La Rosa Luxemburg or I do and look at it and go, actually, no, like this is not good. Like this is this is this is a union capitulating to a bourgeois politician. And that, and that in and of itself is a problem. So yep, yep. the way to make unions more powerful is not to have them become increasingly aligned with, politi with bourgeois political parties. Right. The way to make them more powerful is to make them independent of bourgeois political parties. Yeah, yeah. And to develop political parties, rev sort of radical left political parties in conjunction with the unions. That the union and party go together, and mm. Rosa Luxemburg very much believed in that. That it was a it was a dual struggle where it's the unions and the party go together, and they have to work in tandem. But what she means the party, she does not mean like the Democrats, okay? Right. Yeah. She, or you know, or the liberals up in Canada. She's yeah, talking exactly. about a radical socialist Marxist political party that is organizing in tandem with the union, which is an, in and of itself more militant. And so I think that's I think that's a really crucial element of thinking about the difference between reformism and revolution. Mm -hmm. And she basically she lays out that um, that, that the issue with revisionism um, is, and she's she's very blunt about this. She says sort of the theory of revisionism can therefore be defined in the following way: it is a theory of standing still in the socialist movement built with the aid of vulgar economy on a theory of capitalist standstill. So it's, so Bernstein's point of view, essentially like, well, look at all the gains we're making. We're making capitalism more humane. We don't have to overthrow this system. We can just kind of make it better gradually over time. But the problem with that is that one, are you really making it better? Because that's, I think the argument, because right. for every person who might be benefited by the system, there might be scores of other people who aren't. Yep. And so is it really making the system better, one? And two, are you really changing it or are you putting it at a standstill in that capitalism is sort of, sort of stopped at a better than what it could be or better, not as bad as it could be sort right. of happy medium. And it just kind of stays there forever. But the problem is, is that capitalism is predicated on growth. So you can't just keep something. Yeah, kind you're of taking a snapshot. Along. And then when really what you need is to be taking a video. <laughs> mm -hmm. like, you, you can't say this is the picture of what it is. Exactly, exactly. And that's the bigger issue too. So it's, it's this is the issue that we run into time and time again is that um, that at the end of the day, like revisionism is in and of itself reactionary and that it's not really affirming a socialist society. What it's really doing is trying to sort of buff out the worst aspects of capitalism in the hope, in the hope that it will be socialism later. And, and it's <laughs> yeah. like, and it's like, well, you, are you, you really want to go down that road? Because like, that's the issue here. Yeah. And, that, and the other problem, too, is that like for as easy as for as hard won reforms that can be made under the capitalist system in a sort of liberal, democratic, bourgeois system, they can be easily taken away. Yeah. And if anybody needs any indication of that, look at the gains that were made during the New Deal and the Great Society of the 1960s United States and the rightward turn starting in the 1970s. And it's been the essentially the project of the right to pull those away ever since yes. that happened. So. Every every last vestige of any sort of social democratic provisions under this system in the United States have been continually rolled back and rolled back and rolled back. And this isn't just in the United States. This is a global phenomenon, um, whether it's uh, in England with the NHS, um, where it's sort of privatizing by a thousand cuts. 
Um, I think similar things are happening in yep. Canada. Same so it's, situation here. And again, this is what happens when you're not fundamentally changing the mode of production. When when capitalism is still capitalism, yeah. it will not fundamentally shift itself. You're trying to ask it to do something it will not do. It cannot do because it's not it's not the intention of it, right? Yeah. And why were a lot of the, the gains of the New Deal and the Great Society rolled back in the United States? It was precisely because of the decline of profit yep. in the 1970s. Yep. It was the breakdown of the Bretton Woods system. It was the crisis of capitalism in the 1970s. Union membership was at an union union activism was at an all time high in America. You know, unions. You know, people who, who you know, mil, labor militancy was quite high, and both in Europe and in the United States. And the only real way to to deal with it was to break it. So that's what they did. And what's not to say that we fight for these decades long struggle for reforms that can be removed in a matter of years, Yeah, you know, because it was, yeah, the it can be just taken the next, next time the government changes sometimes. Pretty much. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's, it's the hard won reforms, which may not be perfect, but they can be literally undermined within a matter of months by a certain amount of people. Right. Yeah. Uh, you know, in the United States, abortion rights are a good example of this, where yep. they were legalized in 1973 at a time when, you know, uh, full employment was pretty consistent. You did not have to, ha you know, uh, there was not a sort of a, the need to control a reserve labor army in the way that there is today. I don't think it's a surprise that, that abortion was legalized in the United States in the early 70s. Um, right. It was a reaction to the economic system. As much as it was a political moral one, it was it was a it was an economic one too, um, and with the United States and in, in 2023 or 2022, when you get rid of abortion rights um, with the, the reversal of Roe, um, it's just reaffirming that rollback of the social social democratic protections under a ostensibly liberal republic. So it's get, it's a mess. Got a comment from Nonsequently. Uh, I don't think reform is a solution, but to be fair, it can lessen the damage done, even if temporarily, while we work towards long la towards lasting systemic change. Exactly. That's exactly right. And that's Rosa Luxemburg's point. That's my point, which is that it's not necessarily a problem for reforms, but know what they are. Know that they're not the end goal. Yeah. Bert, she's criticizing reforms as an end in and of them uh, in and of itself, which right, is Bernstein. because it seems to be Bernstein was saying like. Uh, yes, we can work for a reform. And then after that becomes permanent, we can work for another reform. And then that becomes exactly. permanent, we can work for another reform. But that's not really how it works. And one day you wake up and, wow, it's socialism. Like, that's not how this works because nothing is permanent in capitalism, right? All that is solid melts into air. All that is sacred is profane, right? Yeah. There's no – nothing is solid ever. So, like, it's 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 – that's why you have the necessity of that revolutionary fissure. You have to have that because if you don't, the reforms that you did fight for will be reversed. They just will. And we see this time and time again. Um, and so, so, and so that's like the first part of a reform and rev or revolution. And, the sort of second part, she's talking a little – there's a lot of economic theory in this. So she wrote another really famous book called The Accumulation of Capital, which is like her exegesis on Marxist economic theory. Okay. Um, but uh, I think the main thing – I think we've covered most of this in terms of like thinking about it. But um, – oh, okay. So here's one thing that's really important is – one of the reforms you'll often hear about are cooperatives. This is something that Richard Wolff talks a lot about. And this is something that Bernstein and sort of the reform socialists were very big about. But she kind of lays out what might be a problem with co-ops. And, and again, okay. it's sort of the issue within capitalist reforms themselves. The, it, cooperatives in and of themselves are a good thing. Right. But within the context of a bourgeois state, in the process of reform, maybe a problem. So here's what she writes. The workers forming a cooperative in the field of production are thus faced with the contradictory necessity of governing themselves with the utmost absolutism. They are obliged to take toward themselves the role of capitalist entrepreneur, 
a contradiction that accounts for the usual failure of production cooperatives, which either become pure capitalist enterprises or, if the workers' interests continue to predominate, end by dissolving. So it's very hard for cooperatives to work within a capitalist structure. That's why there's not many of them. And the ones that do exist have certain levels of sort of what we would describe as inequality. Right. Um, you know, and so, because here's the thing too, like if, if socialism just means cooperatives, then the market mechanism is not challenged. The notion right. of competition is not challenged either. So, um, so firms are still going to have to compete with one another in a market. And do we want that? Is that a goal? Is that a worthy goal? I don't know. My hunch is like, no, I would much rather yeah. sort of coordinate and plan production based on need rather than just solely doing it on competition. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm, uh, I guess I'm not entirely sure where that, w where, you know, the, you draw the line on that sort of thing, but. Yeah. And then, so she kind of lays out how. You know, within the framework of present society, this is her writing, writing now, producers' cooperatives are limited to the role of simple annexes to consumers' cooperatives. It ceases to be an attack against the principal basis of capitalist economy. It becomes instead a struggle against commercial capital, especially small and middle-sized commercial capital. It becomes an attack made on the twigs of the capitalist tree. So it's, again, it's, it's kind of the issue of like, if everything is like, if we're just going all in on the cooperatives, like those might be good, but again, you're sort of nibbling around the edges and you're not getting to the root. Yeah, and the, what sure. Rosa Luxemburg wants us to do is get to the root, <laughs> which is to, um, you know, actually get it to do something completely different. Um, and she kind of lays it out. Um, you know, she basically says it very clearly. I mean, she just lays it out. Um, in other words, the objective conditions of capitalist society transform the two economic functions of trade unions into a, a, to a sort of labor of Sisyphus, who is nevertheless indispensable. And what she means by that is, you know, the myth of Sisyphus. People know who Albert Camus is. The idea of a guy who keeps rolling a ball up a hill, stone up a hill, and it comes back down. He has to keep rolling it. Yeah. And he has to kind of do that forever. So it's a point of like you're doing all this work for nothing. Um, for a result, for as a result of the activity of his trade unions, the worker succeeds in obtaining for himself the rate of wages due to him in accordance with the situation of the labor power market. As a result of trade union activity, the capitalist law of wages is applied and the effect of the depressing tendency of economic development is paralyzed or to be more exact is attenuated. Um, but this is not, but that's all you can do with trade unions within the capitalist state. Yeah. You can't really do any more. You can work for better wages, you can work for better working conditions and so on, but those have to be in the context of the historical of the historical development of capitalism within your society. Yeah. And so so she lays it out beautifully like the real contrast between reformer revolution on this next page in two sentences. She says, in a word, the social democracy wants to establish the mode of socialist distribution by suppressing the capitalist mode of production. Bernstein's method, on the contrary, proposes to combat the capitalist mode of distribution in the hope of gradually establishing, in this way, the socialist mo mode of production. Mm. This is the real. This is the real crux of it, right? So, a lot of the reforms that Bernstein would argue for can be done in a revolutionary socialist society. This gets back to Trotsky's idea of the permanent revolution. That right. as you're instituting socialism within a society, you're also doing all of these other sort of bourgeois reforms and social reforms along the way that may have, may or may not have been done under the socialist system, but definitely could be achieved under a so, uh, uh, the capitalist system, but could definitely be achieved under the socialist one. Right. And I think that really lays it out, which is that, um, you know, if you if you just leave it up to um, the capitalist state and sort of it's it's kindness to you, you're you're ultimately going to get you're going to get screwed. Ultimately. Yeah, that's right. Um, but what does she say about how a revolution would work in terms of the dictatorship of the proletariat? We're going to come back to that concept. So she writes about it. In a later passage, she writes, The possibility envisaged by Marx is not of the pacific exercise of the dictatorship of the proletariat and not the replacement of the dictatorship with capitalist social reforms. 
there was no doubt for Marx and Engels about the necessity of having the proletariat conquer political power. And she makes a very key distinction about what that means. Because in the Leninist conception, that means the vanguard, right. where the leaders of the masses. She argues that the vanguard would, that these revolutionary intellectuals of the vanguard exist to educate the masses, but to not solely lead them. So she writes in a later passage, hence, here we have the essential difference between coup d'etat among Blanqui's conception. Blanqui is a leader who argued for a revolution led by intellectuals. Um, essentially, people have argued that Leninism is a form of sort of Blanquiism. It's a, po it's a point that people often bring up within Marxist literature, which are accomplished by an active minority and burst out like pistol shots, always inappropriately in the conquest of political power by a great conscious popular mass, which can only be the product of the decomposition of bourgeois society, and therefore bears in itself the economic and political legitimation of its opportune appearance. Um, so here we go in terms of thinking about the importance of the people. So Rosa Luxemburg is an extremely democratic, small d democratic Marxist. She argues that the dictatorship of the proletariat, the, the ruling of a society, or the governance of a society by the working class is done by that working class. It's not done by party intellectuals. It's not done by some vanguard who ends up in power. It's not done by a Politburo. It's done by the people themselves. Now that can take in, that can be in different forms. So that can be workers' councils or Soviets, um, which I mean, she was very much sort of um, in favor of in some respects. It could take the form of um, other forms of socialist cooperatives, but ultimately it, the masses have to be the leading voice. They have yeah. to be the, the intellectuals should follow what the masses do. What masses want, and not the other way around. Yeah. Um, and I think that is a very clear break with what Leninism would sort of evolve into and what a lot of 20th century Marxism would evolve into. Right. In some respects, she is sort of setting the stage for the development of what would be later become known as Marxist humanism or Western Marxism, which is a clear break with Soviet um, or Leninist, do like, like the doctrinaire to Leninism or Stalinism that's coming out of the Soviet Union. Um, so I, you know, so she talks a little bit about like the will of the masses. Do we have any comments? I'll shut up for a second. If we have any comments. Uh, I got, there's one that showed up on, uh, on my thing here from the ultimate reductionist, uh, just says, uh, re revolution. And then, uh, they are, uh, talking about being censored for, on YouTube and Twitter, but that's not unusual for, <laughs> yeah, that's very much not unusual. And it will, and this is a, and I'm, this is not my point. This is something Chris Catrone made a point of, and I agree with him, which is that the more that we become relevant and the more that people are interested in what we're doing, it will get harder for us to do this. Yes. Like it's like, it's the reason it's relatively easy is at the moment. They don't you know, feel threatened by us. They don't feel threatened by us. The moment yeah. they feel threatened by us is the moment it'll be, it'll start to be a lot harder to do what we're doing. Yeah. Um, so. This is a crucial element where she's talking about the will of the masses here. And this is towards the end of Reformer Revolution, where she writes, The peculiar character of this movement resides precisely in the fact that here, for the first time in history, the popular masses themselves, in opposition to the ruling classes, are to impose their will. But they must affect this outside, but they must affect this outside of the present society beyond the existing society. This will, the, this will, the masses can only form in a constant struggle against the existing order. Mm -hmm. So that popular will, right, that notion is so crucial to her thought that she, she is placing the masses, the people, at the center of, her, of what she sees as a revolutionary project. She sees what she's doing as a role of educator and not merely the leader. She's happy to be a leader, but she wants to be a leader among leaders and not merely followers. I like and that. I think, and I think <laughs> that is, that is, I think, something very much to, to um, uh, sort of 
compliment her on and something that is ultimately her disagreements with Lenin. So uh, we're going to pivot because I want to, I'm trying to be conscious of time here. Sure. Uh, we're going to pivot into talking about the next one, which is Leninism or Marxism. Okay. Um, I think it was originally published as, it was originally called Organizational Questions of the Russian Social Democracy, which is not a particularly sexy phrase. So over the, over the years, it's been, it's been <laughs> referred to as Leninism or Marxism. Okay. In this pamphlet, and I'll quote a little less from it, from these next ones as I did from Reform Revolution. In this, she's essentially laying out her main critiques of Leninism, which is centralism. She's very, she's very critical of the way in which political power is centralized under a Leninist conception of the revolutionary state. This is where she uh, sort of aligns with anarchists in some ways. Yes, absolutely. So she's very much critiquing Lenin and laying out the issues with him. She wrote this in like 1904 or five. So like this is where you know pre-actual revolution. This is very pre-revolutionary. Um, yeah, 1904, um, and it was originally published as two articles in 1904. So she's writing about Lenin is developing his theory in real time, and she's responding to it. Um, so she's writing about um, – one thing I think she says right out the bat, which is kind of interesting, is the principal difficulty – this is quoting her – faced by socialist activity in Russia results from the fact that in that country the domination of the bourgeoisie is veiled by absolutist force. This gives socialist propaganda an abstract character while immediate political agitation takes on a democratic revolutionary guise. This is a really crucial point. So 1904, right? This is a year before the, you know, the major uprisings in Russia in 1905, which would lead to other reforms and the creation of the Duma or the, the General right. Assembly of Russia. Um, you know, it was an autocracy. It was, it was ruled by the Romanovs yep. and the Tsar. You know, in many respects, the political situation in Russia pre-1917 was futile. It was this very weird transitional society that had elements of capitalism in it, but also elements of feudalism. And so it's a period of transition where all that the public has ever known of the political situation in their society is absolutism. And I think that it's not just, and I, I don't want to like essentialize here because I don't think that's what she's doing either. I'm not, I, I don't think she's saying like, well, it's the Russian character. They were going to be like this regardless. Right, right. I just think that it's – I think it's critical for us to understand that like it's not – to me, it's not surprising that like the sort of autocratic political tendencies that would eventually develop under Stalin developed out of the real – as a real reaction to the absolutism of the czars. Right. That it's, it's, it's – I'm not saying that they're parallel, but I'm saying like it logically makes sense that like – at certain levels of autocracy, right? That it's based on sort of certain modes of development because Russia never really went through a full democratic bourgeois revolution. Never went through one. It went through a revolution to get rid of the czar and then a socialist revolution, which had liberal sort of bourgeois elements to it, as Trotsky wrote about. And then it was the Soviet Union for 70 years. And then they had sort of a a counter-revolution, the disillusion of the Soviet Union and, and the installation of sort of liberal democracy via outside forces. I mean, Naomi Klein writes about, I think, this part, the, the destruction of the Soviet Union, the development of Russian capitalism brilliantly in her book, The Shock Doctrine, to get a sense of how autocratic that was too, yeah. right? So in some respects, the Russian system has always had certain levels of autocracy within it that mm -hmm. have been often mm -hmm. hard to, often hard to to fight. Now, I'm not going to be a crappy liberal here and say, well, that's just like the Russian mind or whatever. It's like, no, right. not true. These developed out of real material conditions. And yeah. it was also with levels of democracy, right? So like early on the Bolsheviks, like they decriminalized homosexuality and they yep. legalized abortion. And like, you know, in East Germany in, you know, in the 1970s, they were doing um, transitional care for trans people. Like it's not to say that there weren't things that were extremely positive or social democratic that came out of that system. There were, but right. they were also tied with these autocratic tendencies, which weren't really in the service of developing socialism further. Right. And that's kind of her broader point. Um, and so she sort of lays out her main criticism of him, which is centralism. So she is, um, she says, 
Lenin reasons that the combination of the socialist mass movement with such a rigorously centralized type of organization is a specific principle of revolutionary Marxism. And she sort of lays out why that may not necessarily be the case mm. and how um, and how even if that were the case, um, it would be a huge issue down the road, as we kind of have seen in the history of the Soviet Union. Yeah. Um, and she kind of lays out in another passage something I think is really the difference between Lenin centralism and a sort of social democratic centralism. And she writes – um, for this reason, social democratic centralism, sort of what she's arguing for in, in, in some respects, cannot be based on the mechanical subordination or blind obedience of the party membership to the leading party center. For this reason, the social democratic movement, which in this context means socialism, those were terms were used interchangeably back then. Okay. Um, social democratic movement cannot allow the erection of an airtight partition between class con the class conscious nucleus of the proletariat already in the party and its immediate popular environment, the non-party sections of the proletariat. Right. There can be no separation. There can be no separation. Leninism kind of splits them. Yeah. And subordinates the nucleus to the, to the, to the out, outer ranks. Right. Yeah. Now the two principles in which Lenin centralism rests are precisely these. One, the blind subordination in the smallest detail of all party organs to the party center, which right. alone thinks, guides, and decides for all, and two, the rigorous separation of the organized nucleus of revolutionaries from its social revolutionary surroundings. She sees this as terrible. Yeah, she and, nails it. <laughs> and she nails it because she's right. Yeah. <laughs> she's absolutely right. The moment that you have a revolutionary political party that is separated from the masses themselves, one, it's politically inert. It can't do anything. It, it, it is, you know, it's impotent. Mm. And two, it's, it's lending itself towards an authoritarianism, which then undermines its very goals, which is to yeah. build that socialist society. Yeah. It no longer, and, it turns itself from uh, socialism into mm -hmm. the bourgeois state. Exactly. Exactly. And she she writes it even – she kind of hits the point home again in another passage where she writes, the ultra-centralism asked by Lenin is full of the sterile spirit of the overseer. It is not a positive and creative spirit. Lenin's concern is not so much to make the activity of the party more fruitful as to control the party, to narrow the movement rather than to develop it, to blind – rather than to unify it. It's pretty clear. And I think she's right. And I think if you look at the long term, if you look at how this went, yeah. she was absolutely right. Yeah. And she in some respects, it's, when you read it, you're kind of, it's eerie because you're like, oh shit. Like she could see Stalin coming a mile away. She right. knew, she knew that if, that if you instituted some of these, these reforms in the, or some of these political ideas of centralism, as constituted under the Leninist conception, that it could lend itself, not necessarily automatically, it's not right. like, but it know, could, but it could. And history shows us that it did. Yeah, that's right. And, and so I think that's very, very, very prescient. Um, the next, before we, uh, uh, sorry, yeah. I, uh, just before we move on, uh, I got a comment from Velkin 999, uh, just saying, hi, Corey and Justin, just jumping in to say, hi, I'm close to catching up on your backlog and I'll catch more streams after. Oh, thank you so much. I really appreciate that. Awesome. And feel free to leave comments. Um, you can always um, also leave feedback at my website, which is right down there. Yep. There's a little form, justinclark.org, or email Corey too, um, about if there's a book you're interested in us doing. Um, I've pretty much scheduled out 2024 of the books I think I'm going to do, but I'm always willing to change that. I change it all the time. Yeah, based on yeah. what I hear from what people might want to me hear me talk about, and also my own mood and like what I want to do. So, yeah. um, the essay in the book that I think uh, anarchists will really, really dig is the mass strike um, essay, which is very, very long. We won't go into too much detail about it because a lot of it's like the history of Russian strikes over a oh, fifteen-year okay. period. Um, 
But the main point, I think, from the mass strike, and I think the big takeaway from it is that political revolutions are predicated on these mass strike events. That like, you have to have an organized political mass who is willing to carry out some of these things. And that the more that they do it, the more the possibility of revolution is possible. This one's, I think, very relevant in considering labor. She's talking about strikes in the law in this passage. She says, in a state in which every form and expression of the labor movement is forbidden, which in Russia at that time it kind of was, those are my little brackets there, in which the simplest strike is a political crime, it must logically follow that every economic struggle will become a political one. So she's really criticizing in the mass strike this idea that like, well, there's the political situation and then there's the economic situation mm. and neither the twain shall meet. And as a good Marxist, she's like, no, 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 no. Those two go together. Yeah. Those are the same thing. <laughs> those are the same thing. They're the same thing. Um, and because politics informs economics and economics informs politics in a dialectical way, it's, it's, those go together. So, um, so it's very much, I think, important to note that like, as, labor struggles continue to heat up in the United States, we're going to start seeing, I think, in many respects, more legal pushback, um, uh, especially against political positions which are not seen as um, orthodox. So, for example, right. um, there were, I think there was like a Starbucks union who who said, who made a sort of a statement of solidarity with Gaza, and right. that led to issues with the corporate leadership. Yeah. So, you know, that's always the, that's always the trick that's like always the struggle that you're going to deal with organizing a union within the context of a bourgeois system. Yeah. I want to say there was a, again, there in Canada, there was, I think there was a, a regional union that made a statement in support of the Palestinian people. And uh, they got pushed back from a variety of places, but then they got supported by the, the national union that like, so the, the, the whole union politics thing, it, it's, uh, it's pretty important that they, they work on the same level. Yes, yes, exactly. Another thing I'll mention, and this is something I think anarchists will appreciate, is, is the role that she places for spontaneity in mass strikes. Hmm. So she has this great quote, which is, in short, in the mass strikes in Russia, the element of spontaneity plays such a predominant part, not because the Russian proletariat are quote unquote uneducated, but because revolutions do not allow anyone to play the schoolmaster with them. This is a very crucial element. This goes back to what she's saying in Reformer Revolution that the masses guide where the leadership goes, not the other way around. Right. And I think that that's I think that's pretty cool. And I think that's something anarchists can dig. Yep. Um, I, you know, in. Uh, I it's kind of the whole anti-party thing that's going on, right? Is like yeah. because because all these parties are led by a, an elite group of like people that are like not accountable to yes. to the members and often unelected, un, like unaccountable in any way. And so, like right. we see, like I, again, referring to the situation in Gaza, the NDP, like the leaders just kicked out of, of the Ontario NDP just kicked out a representative that was elected who had openly supported Palestine and, and uh, Palestinians and was elected on the same by the people who supported her, but got kicked out of the, the NDP because of her statements on the current situation. Yeah. So the leadership went against what the people actually wanted. Yes. And I can tell you from my own experience in political organizing um, that, and I'm not going to name any names specifically, but what I can tell you is that usually within a political organization, there's one or two people who are particularly like charismatic. Mm. They're the ones that kind of naturally, for some reason, kind of become the center of gravity in the party. And while we might vote on certain things you know, at least in my experience, like nine times out of 10, we did what the charismatic person wanted. You know, there wasn't a yeah. ton of thought in it. There wasn't a ton of discussion. There was more just a word. And, and it's not to say that some of those decisions were wrong. Most of them were totally fine. But I do think it's a point to be made that like, you know, a lot of the, the decisions that we were making were fairly rink a dink. I mean, they weren't that big a deal. Right. It can be, it can be, uh, it could go bad. If, you know, yes. if it's only the things that these particular people like. Yes. And so I think that it's, 
you know, I think that's the trouble with parties is that you, you, you don't want to, I don't know. It's tricky because it's like, how do you create a political party in which people are fairly equal, but then things still get done? Cause like, that's the thing too, is that like some people may have more initiative than others, but is yep. it our, it should be our, maybe our job to sort of encourage initiative. I mean, it's really tricky. I, I, I you it know, I don't, yeah. there's no doubt like that the, uh, maintaining the like doing things without a hundred percent consensus is it means that some people are not getting the thing that they want. And like, there's, it's tough. Right. But yeah, exactly. And so with the mass strike, I mean, her bigger points is like all of these broader strike movements that have happened in Russia over a period of 10 or so years up until about 1917 um, when you have the Bolshevik revolution but she's writing about how every time you have these big mass strikes that are led by the workers, they lead to political reforms, they lead to economic reforms. Some of them end up getting the eight hour day. Some of them end up getting like a 10 hour day, but they get better money. Um, the czar can't sort of be completely autocratic anymore. The development of you know, like mass strikes often become the catalyst for the development of labor unions. So again, this is her sort of centraling the people and the masses as yeah. a part of that political paradigm because they are the ones who set the policy because it's their actions. It's them withholding their labor power that yeah. is changing the system. And uh, yeah, I think that's, I think that's pretty neat. And, and so as she, and she basically makes the argument that mass strikes are sort of in they're they're inseparable from revolution. They are necessary. Yeah. Um, so the last one we'll talk about um, is the last essay, which is reform, uh, which is the Russian Revolution, okay, um, which was written uh, in around 1918. Um, this is the one that was published posthumously. It wasn't published during her lifetime because, like I said, she was murdered in 1919. Um, but she wrote about it, and her positions on the Russian Revolution remind me very much of another, I think, influential socialist, but on this side of the Atlantic, and that's um, Eugene B. Debs. So I've done okay. some research on Eugene B. Debs, the American socialist labor leader, one of the co-founders of the IWW, you know, founder and leader of the American Railway Union, um, ran for president multiple times in the Socialist Party ticket, um, all around badass. U Eugene B. Debs very much had a, a similar position to hers, which is the Russian Revolution is a good thing that it was a mm. positive thing and mm -hmm. that the, the that the consequences of the revolution are yet to be seen so like so she's saying like the initial revolt the overthrow of the czar the institution the provisional government that's a good step an even yeah. better step are the soviets overthrowing that system and okay. instituting the soviet system um led by the bolsheviks but then she's then critical of some of the early moves that the that the Bolsheviks make, okay, and Lenin and Trotsky make. So she really does start with um, what sounds like a pretty darn full throated defense of the revolution. She writes, "The Russian Revolution is the mightiest event of the World War, meaning World War One, because this happens during World War One. Its outbreak." It's unexampled radicalism, its enduring consequences constitute the clearest condemnation of the lying phrases which official social democracy so zealous, zealously supplied at the beginning of the war as an ideological cover for German imperialism's campaign of conquest. So that needs a little context. So um, the SPD, the, the Social Democratic Party of Germany, um, led by Karl Kautsky, decided to go all in on the war. So they supported the war. They voted for the war credits. She didn't. She vehemently stand, stood against them, and she and Karl Liebknecht and others left the SPD and started to form their own party um, because they were disgusted that like the socialist movement would support this imperialist war of national of competing nationalisms. Like yeah. this is everything we fight against. Why are we defending this? And the one of the key elements of Lenin's conception of the revolution in Russia was the idea of revolutionary defeatism. So it's like we we want to get out of the war. One of the big things that that the Bolsheviks promised was we will get out of the war, which the the provisional government under Kerensky after the Tsar was overthrown in 1917 wanted to continue involvement in the war, which the public didn't. Ah. 
And so one of the ways that the Bolsheviks really did gain power was by promising, we'll get out of the war, right. which is a promise they kept. I mean, that was basically a promise they kept um, at the, with the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk. They, they, they got out of the war. So that is a promise kept, but it's an imperfect promise or it's an imperfect um, uh, uh, it's just an imperfect victory. Right. Um, so she sort of praises their internationalism. She praises the fact that, um, so she pretty much writes here. She's like, there is no doubt either that the wise heads at the helm of the Russian revolution, that Lenin and Trotsky on their thorny path beset by traps of all kinds have taken many a decisive step only with the greatest inner hesitation and with most violent inner opposition. So she's sort of making the argument that like, there's a lot of things that they've done that I don't agree with, but I understand the logic of why they might have been done. And I can understand why those may have been a problem, even to the people doing them. Right. right. Which is exactly how Trotsky felt about the Kronstadt rebellion, which we talked about in, in an earlier episode where he, right. he didn't love that that had to happen, but it was the only thing to keep the, to keep that going. Because as soon as the Bolshevik revolution happens, there is, multiple countries getting involved in trying to overthrow them. Right. So it's they they are in a they are in a sort of siege mentality which lends itself towards I think more autocratic policies. Yes. Yeah. And um which is pretty much what she she lays out. So she kind of writes about how um so she sort of writes about how the party this is a good – she has – this is an essential lesson, lesson that she sort of has here about like – she's saying, quote, In this, the Russian Revolution has but confirmed the basic lesson of every great revolution, the law of its being, which decrees either the revolution must advance at a rapid, stormy, and resolute tempo, break down all barriers with an iron hand, and place its goals ever farther ahead, or is quite soon thrown backward behind its feeble point of departure and suppressed by counter-revolution. This is the tricky part. This is why, like, I will always stress to people that, like, be careful what you wish for. Because, like, yeah, a revolution might happen, and you might think it might be a good thing, but it may end up not being a good thing at all. That what replaces what came before could be worse. And that's the thing I think yeah. that we as, as, as socialists, we on the left, no matter what your tendency is, I think that's something we have to be, we, like, we have to be cognizant of. Yeah. Is that it could fail or it could succeed but in its but in its success, it kills everything that we believed in. Right. You know, like, yeah. You know, uh, it's that classic you know quote from The Dark Knight. It's like you either die a hero, or you live long enough to see yourself become the villain. And I think some of that's true in the case of the Bolshevik Revolution. Um, and so she kind of writes about the role of the party. Um, but basically, she sort of lays out her criticisms of some of the early policies of the Bolsheviks led by Lenin and Trotsky. So one of the ones that she's very critical of is the Bolshevik land policy. Um, so she says, ideally, a socialist transformation of economic relationships presupposes two things so far as agrarian relationships are concerned. In the first place, only the nationalization of the large landed estates as the technically most advanced and most concentrated means and methods of agrarian production can serve as the point of departure for the socialist mode of production on the land. Every socialist economic reform on the land must obviously begin with large and medium land ownership. This is not what the Bolsheviks did. What they actually did was, um, the, as she writes here, the seizure of the landed estates by the peasants, according to the short and precise slogan of, slogan of Lenin and his friends, go and take the land for yourselves, simply led to the sudden chaotic conversion of large land ownership into peasant land ownership. Mm. What was created is not social property, but a new form of private property, namely right. the breaking up of large estates into medium and small estates or relatively advanced large units of production into primitive small units which operate with technical means from the time of the fair house. So the better way of doing agriculture would have been collectivism from the start. Right. Collectivization from the start. This is all of ours, not, and not just yours. If you take it. Exactly. <laughs> this is, we're going to, we're going to collectively, we're going to collectively own this and develop yeah. this via planning. If you do that from the outset, you got a better chance of it succeeding. Right. But the problem was, they, the Bolsheviks could not do that because they had promised the people land. Mm. 
so, you know, their slogan was peace, land, and bread, right? So they, they promised these people the land. So instead of setting up collectivization from the start, which would have probably been a better policy, they divvied up everything, sort of peasantized it, and then years later tried to sort of retcon it back into collectivization. <laughs> which that, doesn't work very well. <laughs> yes. So here's what she it, – it's so crazy. I wrote in my margins on this one. She was right. But she, he, she wrote, the Leninist agrarian reform has created a new and powerful layer of popular enemies of socialism on the countryside, enemies whose resistance will be much more dangerous and stubborn than that of the noble large landowners. Mm. She's writing about the, what would become the kulaks who resisted collectivization under Stalin, right? which led to catastrophic results. Like it's, it's crazy. Like she, she's like, she's calling it all. Like, and it's like, I'm like, I'm, I'm always blown away. It's kind of remarkable. The other one that she is very critical of is the notion of national self-determination. And the reason that she's critical of this is she writes here, Moreover, the Bolsheviks themselves have, to a great extent, sharpened the, effect, the objective difficulties of this situation by a slogan which they place in the foreground of their policies, the so-called right of self-determination of peoples, or something which was really implicit in the slogan, the disintegration of Russia. Again, think about it in the context of, lane, of the agrarian question. Now let's think about the national question. Mm. If the Russian Empire had not been divvied up early on, and it stayed consistently under the Soviet system at the outset. Right. It was a very good shot that that would have worked out better than what they ended up doing, which is splitting up all the countries based on right, right to self-determination. And then years later, either some of them voluntarily joining back into the Soviet Union post-1922, mm. or they were compulsorily added into the system post-World War II. So you think of like the Soviet bloc or the Warsaw Pact countries, yeah. where Stalin basically just said, I want these countries as a buffer zone between me and Germany. And you had that system never been developed, in the, like had this national self-determination question been, been addressed better off, and in, at the outset, they could have had a problem, right? Because, like on the on the face of it, national self determination sounds great, and in some contexts, it's the right thing to do. But in the context of the revolution, it was an issue. So it's yeah. so fascinating because she she's very critical also of the 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 dissolution of the constituent assemblies, okay. which is something our 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 viewer, some random geek, always mentions. Because um, <laughs> I know I guess Rudolf Rocker has a good essay on this too. But basically, she, she says, I don't know if she meant for this to be kind of catty, but it's great. So she writes like, while they showed a co quite cool contempt for the constituent assembly, universal suffrage, freedom of press and assemblage, in short, for the whole apparatus of the basic democratic liberties of the people, which taken all together, constituted the right of self-determination inside Russia – they treated the right of self-determination of peoples as a jewel of democratic policy for the sake of which all practical considerations of real criticism had to be stilled. Yeah. So it's like she's like laying out. She's like, so you're taking all away of all these liberties. And but at the same time, you're like sort of trying to give these other nations liberties because you think it will might be beneficial later on. Because the other issue, too, is that like these 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 countries of national self-determination, they could go, actually, we want to be capitalist. Fuck you. We're going to join with the United States and Europe. We're going to invade you. Right. Or or if you think of the Kronstadt rebellion, it's the other way where they're like, we want to be more radical than you are. Right. Like we yeah. want to do something <laughs> outside of what you're doing. Yeah. And we can't have that. Well, you gave them self-determination. So like. <laughs> so either acknowledge it or don't. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah. It's you can't put the toothpaste back in the tube. It's yeah. really ultimately the issue here. Um, so <laughs> she she writes about Lenin in relation to this. She says Lenin and his comrades clearly calculated that there was no sure method of binding the many foreign peoples within the Russian Empire to the cause of the revolution, to the cause of the socialist proletariat, than that of offering them in the name of the revolution and of socialism the most extreme and, and most unlimited freedom to determine their own fate, which is kind of like. It's kind of because you could see it as like giving them freedom, but you could also see it as kind of hanging them out to dry. Right. But like in the event of a civil war, which that definitely happened, that like if we let go of some of these other nations and they end up sort of falling under the, the, the sort of the thumb of like Western imperialist countries, we won't have to worry about it because we kind of let them go. Some of that happened. I mean, you know, 
in, in the case of like, um, I think in the case of, uh, was it Austria? Um, but exactly as she writes here on one after another, these nations use the freshly granted freedom to ally themselves with German imperialism against the Russian revolution yeah. as its mortal enemy and under German protection to carry the banner of counter revolution into Russia itself. So it's pretty darn clear. I mean, you know, um, uh, that, that, that was not a great deal. That wasn't a great idea either. Um, I think in principle, you can make the argument that it's a good idea. Right. But it really wasn't. So she writes about, obviously, she has a section on the Constituent Assembly. The well-known dissolution of the Constituent Assembly in November 1917 played an outstanding role in the policy of the Bolsheviks. So she kind of quotes like all of the different things Lenin's trying to guarantee to people. And then she says, and then after these declarations, Lenin's first step after the October Revolution was, and then she puts in an ellipses, the dissolution of the same constituent assembly to which it was supposed to be an entrance. Um, and so she's very critical of this because, again, the constituent assembly is a means by which the people, the masses, can then govern the society. You kill the constituent assemblies. And then reconstitute them, I think, as what they did were like the Council of Workers Deputies, which is kind of what they would develop later. But those were then controlled more by the party intelligentsia than they were controlled by the public. It is precisely the revolution which creates by its glowing heat the delicate, vibrant, sensitive political atmosphere in which the waves of popular feeling, the pulse of popular life, work for the moment on the representative bodies in most wonderful fashion. So, so she... So she's pretty clear about about how she felt that that was a terrible, terrible idea. Yeah. And ultimately, her big thing was that she ultimately believed that democracy begets more democracy. So she further writes here, all this shows that the cumbersome mechanism of democratic institutions possesses a powerful corrective, namely the living moment of the living movement of the masses, their unending pressure. And the more democratic the institutions, the livelier and stronger the pulse beat of the political life of the masses. The more direct and complete is their influence, despite rigid party banners, outgrown tickets, electoral lists, etc. So she's she's saying, like, yes, they all have these like limitations. Like demo democratic institutions have their limitations. But in some respects, they're also their strengths because it slows people down. Right. And it makes them reflect upon what they're doing, which I think is I think is very important. So in killing, you know, and sort of killing that, um, you know, it, it really it really kind of messes it up. Um, she also talks about the limitations of suffrage under the system, which was a huge problem, too. Um, and and then ultimately, I want to leave you because we're getting towards the end here. I want to leave you with a quote about freedom. Okay. So the thing about us as socialists is the goal, at least in my conception of socialism, in my Marxist humanist tradition, the goal is freedom. That can come in different forms, but the end goal is freedom. People often think that we as socialists like our be and be all end all is equality. Some of that's true, but it's equality in service of freedom. Yeah. Because equality means jack shit if you can't do anything with it. Yeah, that's right. So she writes here. And this is so important in thinking about like opposition, because obviously, like not only did the Bolsheviks later on, they would ban opposition political parties. They started imprisoning and killing political dissenters. They started going after members of the own of their own communist party. Like there was constant dissent was being stifled yeah. in the name of the broader goals. You know, it was always seen as well. The ends justify the means. Right. But the problem is, is that we don't have, sometimes we don't have ends. All we have are means. And the means constitute ends. As, a, as an anarchist, you cannot have the ends you want if you use means that are contradictory to them. <laughs> yes, exactly. So here's what she writes. And this is a beautiful statement, absolutely gorgeous statement that I would like, like put this on like a, like a monument. Freedom only for the supporters of the government only for the members of one party, how member, however numerous they may be, is no freedom at all. Freedom is always and exclusively freedom for the one who thinks differently. Not because of any fanatical concept of justice, but because all that is instructive, wholesome, and purifying in political freedom depends on this essential characteristic. And its effectiveness vanishes when freedom becomes a special privilege. And that is exactly what did happen in the Soviet Union. 
There were no opposition political parties. Political dissent was stifled. You had, um, and so in many respects, had Rosa Luxemburg lived to see what it would become, she would have written about it very much how Trotsky wrote about it in his book, The Revolution Betrayed, where he lays out where he think every, he thought everything went wrong. Right. And I think that she would do a very similar take. She'd write about what went wrong and go even farther than Trotsky and like call out his errors and call out Lenin's right. errors, which he clearly does in this pamphlet. And you have to remember, this pamphlet was not published until the 1930s. Oh, yeah. So it's it was published in, I think, 1936. So oh, for the first time in English. It was published in English for the first time in, uh, let's see. First published posthumously in 1922 and then published in English in 1940. So again, like it's <laughs> it's really prescient where she's getting at here. Yeah. So – Rosa Luxemburg is, I think, a incredible writer, an incredible political thinker. She is someone who clearly understands the limits and the issues associated with revolution, but nevertheless calls for revolution still. Yeah. And that's worthwhile because we have to be critical of ourselves and we have to be willing to know if we're wrong. Yeah. And she is constantly reaffirming the value of the masses, of the political, of the polis in sort of Aristotelian language, right. of the community making decisions and not solely the leaders. Because if you have a society where only the leaders make decisions, you have tyranny, yeah. period. And it doesn't matter what form it comes in. And so – Call it whatever you want. That's not – Call it whatever you want. <laughs> Doesn't matter. It's not real freedom. Yeah, freedom is the right to think differently, and I think that is that is a, is a lesson that is especially important right now in our trying times, where it's becoming harder and harder to speak differently. Yeah, that you know that you you have to, and you have to fight for it. Yep. Well, I think that was good. Um, yeah. <laughs> I guess we're back on Thursday. We're, we're back on ahead. Thursday. We'll be back uh, in two days. Um, uh, the book we'll be doing next week or next time rather will be, um, it will be American crusade by Andrew Seidel. Um, we were going to be doing, um, road to nowhere by Paris Marx, and we will still be doing that book. I'm just still reading it because I read this other book first because it was fascinating. Andrew Seidel is a constitutional attorney. He is a part of the, the Freedom from Religion Foundation and Americans United for Separation of Church and State. Yeah. Um, we're going back to sort of our atheist roots a little bit in next, in next time's episode because we're going to be talking about the assault on the freedom to think differently, as Rosa Luxemburg would call it, by the extreme right-wing Christian nationalist Supreme Court in the United States. We're going to talk about – how did the court get this way and what are some of the bad decisions that they've made and what we can do to maybe change it. Um, and uh, I look forward to it. it be a little more topical, but I think it'll still have enough historical stuff that will be interesting that sure. will sort of be evergreen. But I think that's going to be an interesting conversation for next time. Right on. Well, I guess all that's left is where can people find you? So you can always find me at my website. It's uh, justinclark.org right down there. Um, that's where I have most of my writing. That's not for the Indiana historical bureau. That writing is always on the Indiana history blog. Um, but my other writing is available at justinclark.org. Um, my newest piece on Ingersoll and Lincoln is in the truth seeker, the 150th anniversary issue of the truth seeker, um, which just was published. Um, and if you're interested in reading that, please get a hold of me. I'll be, I'd be happy to send you my copy of that essay. Um, and, uh, as I always say at the end, support us on Patreon. Corey works really hard to make these really cool. And, and, uh, I think it would be great if you could become a patron. Um, you get all of the pregame, you get the post game, you get all kinds of really cool stuff that way. So, yep. um, definitely become a patron as well. Yeah. Definitely make sure that you like, let me know if you like the, the way that yeah. things are edited. Cause Absolutely. You know, I've been doing, we do more of the quotes specifically from the book and Corey does a really good job at editing the quotes. I was trying to be more slow in reading them this That's time. That's perfect. Tonight That's awesome. To give you that space <laughs> to do all that. Right on. Um, and, uh, and yeah, no, I think, I think that he, he's been doing a fabulous job 
with um, not just the editing, but with like the thumbnails and like the framing of the episodes. I love it. Um, the Bertrand yeah. Russell one really went off like gangbusters. People really liked that one, yeah. um, which is cool. Um, so yeah, good stuff all around. But yeah, definitely support on Patreon. Much appreciated. Well, thank you everybody for uh, joining us in the chat and watching it live. And thank you to our, our regular listeners who just download the episodes or watch it on YouTube later. Yes. Thank you all so much for your support. We really appreciate it. All right. That's all folks. Thanks for watching or listening. Uh, remember to share this show with your friends and on the social media site that you use the most. Thank you to everyone who supports this show on Patreon. I really appreciate it. And it helps me keep the internet and power on. Thanks to my top patrons, Some Random Geek, Damian Marie at Hope, Justin Clark, Christopher Taylor, Dan F. Smith, and Lisa Glass. And thank you to my new patrons. You can stay tuned for the list of patrons at the end to see your name listed. If you aren't a patron and want to contribute, you can do that at patreon.com slash skeptical leftist, or you can send a one-time donation to buymeacoffee.com slash skeptical lefty. These days, I also have a Substack and a Ghost where you can subscribe for free or you can donate a per month. And lastly, you can get a paid subscription on Spotify that will give you the same access to bonus content and extra long episodes. If you can't contribute financially, then a like on YouTube or a five-star rating and a review on Apple Podcasts or one of the podcast review sites like Podchaser would be great. If you want to find more from me, then make sure to check out the show notes for links to all my stuff or check out my website, skepticalleftist.com. That's where you can find all of my social media spaces and communities, as well as the other shows that I do. You can also email me at mindofaskepticalleftist at gmail.com. Thanks so much for listening or watching. Make sure to leave a comment on the video or on my website. Join your local org, print off some posters or pamphlets, and spread the propaganda. Also, make sure to stick around for a clip from this episode's post-show chat between me and Justin. What I can tell you is that it's it's it really is the worst violence we've seen in nearly two decades, and it's not going to let up anytime soon because neither in, in Israel nor the United States are interested in letting it up anytime soon. They could stop. I mean, that's kind of the Good. difference. It's like they could stop all of this. They have all the power. Yep. You know, they could just stop this. They could be the bigger person and make Hamas look like a piece of shit. They could do all yep. of that, but they don't want to. Because it's the justification to do what they've wanted to do all along.